This is a revision video for the GCSE chemistry topic of covalent bonding. In this video, we're going to define what we mean by a molecule, describe how a covalent bond forms, draw dot and cross diagrams for the eight examples of small covalent molecules listed in the AQA GCSE specification, evaluate whether a dot and cross diagram is the best type of model to use, and then also list some examples of giant covalent structures. We're not going to look at the properties of covalent substances, which gets a separate video, and we're not going to look in great detail at giant covalent structures, which also get their own separate video. When chemistry novices first start discussing substances, one of the things we find is that a lot of people are not very clear on what's an atom and what's a molecule and what's a lattice. So let's just be really clear before we start. An atom is the smallest part of an element that can exist. We can break atoms into smaller pieces like protons or electrons, but if you just have a proton or you just have an electron, then you don't have a particular element anymore. Often we simplify diagrams of atoms by just drawing them as simple circles. So these circles here could represent the noble gas argon. When we're talking about a molecule, we're not talking about individual atoms anymore. We're talking about a group of atoms that have been covalently bonded together. And we'll talk in a second about what a covalent bond is, but the crucial thing is that only non-metals form covalent bonds. So if you're looking at a substance that contains any metal atoms, then you shouldn't be describing it as molecular. In order to know whether a substance contains covalent bonds, we need to know whether the elements that make it up are metals or non-metals, because it's only non-metals that form covalent bonds. We can find this information out by looking at the periodic table. Metals are found on the left of the table and non-metals on the right. And the easiest way to separate them is by drawing a line either here or depending on the specification you followed, possibly here. It doesn't matter that there are a few elements which are between the two lines because these metalloids or semi-metals, which have some properties of metals and some properties of non-metals, are not examined at all in GCSE chemistry. Instead, we're just going to say that all of these elements in purple form covalent bonds, and also hydrogen here. If you've watched the ionic bonding video, then you know that when non-metals bond, they have a tendency to accept electrons. They gain enough electrons to ensure that their outer shell is full. So when lithium bonds with fluorine, lithium, which is the metal, gives one electron to fluorine, which is the non-metal. And as a result, the lithium forms a positive ion and the fluorine forms a negative fluoride ion. But when two non-metal atoms bond, they're both short of electrons. And so one can't give an electron to the other one. So instead of having electron transfer, what we actually have is electron sharing. And so there is a pair of electrons that both atoms have access to. And this is what we call a covalent bond, a shared pair of electrons. As part of GCSE chemistry, you need to be able to draw eight named examples of small covalent molecules. And when we say small, we're not just sort of casting judgment on how big it is. It's actually a technical term. So small covalent molecule is one phrase that you need to know. Now, in these diagrams, which we call dot and cross diagrams, we're going to use dots and crosses to represent electrons. There's no difference between them. It's just to make it easier to see where those electrons are coming from. We're also only going to draw the outer shell of the atoms, because otherwise we'd be drawing a whole lot of extra shells and electrons that aren't taking place in the bonding. It's only the outer shell electrons that bond. So each covalent bond that you draw has to have one or more pairs of electrons. You're never going to have a single electron on its own. We'll start with hydrogen, which is the most straightforward. Hydrogen has an atomic number of one and therefore has a single electron per atom. So in order for each hydrogen atom to have a full outer shell, it needs access to two electrons. It needs one more. And so each hydrogen atom is going to contribute its one electron to the bond. And it's also going to benefit from the electron from the other atom sharing that bond. So here we have a dot and a cross. That's all you need to do for the diagram for hydrogen. Remember, because it's in the first row of the periodic table, it only has one shell, and so it only needs two electrons in total. We don't need to draw any more after we've done the covalent bond. Next up, we have chlorine. Chlorine is in group seven, 
So again, it needs to gain one electron because then it will have eight in its outer shell. So because it needs to gain one electron, it needs to make one covalent bond. So again, we have a dot and a cross representing the electrons that have come from either atom. And that leaves us with six electrons per atom that are not part of the covalent bond. So these can be put onto the rest of the atom like this. We tend to draw them in pairs, but you still get the marks even if you don't do this. Now, if we know how hydrogen bonds and we know how chlorine bonds, we should be able to draw a diagram for hydrogen chloride. So hydrogen has one electron and needs one more to have a full outer shell. Chlorine has seven electrons in its outer shell already, and so it still needs one more. Both atoms need to make one strong covalent bond. So we have our dot and our cross. That's all of the electrons that hydrogen has, so we don't need to do anything else to the picture of hydrogen, but chlorine still needs its additional six electrons. Methane is another one of our examples. Carbon is in group four, so it needs to gain four electrons, whereas hydrogen still only needs one. So one carbon atom bonds with four hydrogen atoms, and there is a strong covalent bond between each pair of atoms. Dot and cross, dot and cross, dot and cross, dot and cross. So now the carbon atom almost feels, if it was human, like it has eight electrons. We don't need to draw any more electrons on this diagram. Ammonia is fairly similar. Nitrogen is in group five, so it needs three electrons and it needs to make three strong covalent bonds. So we can fill those in. But after we filled all of this in, nitrogen still only has six electrons in its outer shell and it's only used three of its electrons. And we know that being in group five, nitrogen actually has five outer shell electrons. So that leaves two to be what we call a lone pair. And as you can see, now if we count up all of the electrons, nitrogen has a full outer shell and it has used all five of the outer shell electrons that the nitrogen atom already had. We can do something similar with water. Oxygen is in group six and therefore it needs two electrons to get a full outer shell and so it needs to make two strong covalent bonds. Dot cross, dot cross, and as you can see, that's only four electrons. We need to draw another four which makes sense because oxygen had six and so far we've only used two of them. So the remaining four go here and here, two lone pairs. The last two molecules are slightly different and slightly more complicated, but hopefully you'll see how they work once we've gone through them. We've already said that oxygen is in group six, so it needs to gain two electrons in order to have a full outer shell. That means it needs to make two strong covalent bonds. But we know from just looking at nature that oxygen exists as a diatomic or divalent molecule, a molecule made of two atoms. So each oxygen atom is only bonded to one other oxygen atom. But we just said it needed to make two bonds. So what it actually does is make a double covalent bond with two pairs of electrons in it. So two electrons from each atom are contained in that bond and that means we've got a further four electrons that need to be drawn on as two lone pairs per atom. Nitrogen follows a similar pattern to oxygen. Nitrogen is in group five and so it needs to gain three electrons in order to have a full outer shell and so we would expect it to make three strong covalent bonds as it did in ammonia. But we know that in nature nitrogen exists as another one of these diatomic or divalent molecules so each atom is only bonded to one other atom. The solution, of course, is to make that bond a triple covalent bond, containing three pairs of electrons. And so since nitrogen is in group five, with five electrons in its outer shell, and we've only used three of them in this bond, that means there must be two electrons left over to be a lone pair. In addition to representing small covalent molecules using full dot and cross diagrams, which show all of the electrons in the outer shells, there are also some other models we can use. This model in which we use a single straight line to represent a covalent bond is a really common one, particularly for more common molecules where it would take us a huge amount of time and effort to draw all the electrons. Notice that for oxygen and nitrogen, we use a double line and a triple line to represent the double and triple covalent bonds. 
In addition to the full dot and cross diagram and the model where we use a single straight line for a covalent bond, you may also be shown Lewis diagrams, which show the dots and crosses, but without the circles representing the shells, and also this 3D model. Each of these models has its own advantages and disadvantages. Incidentally, you don't need to know the names of the models, it's just hard for me to explain what the advantages and disadvantages are without you knowing what they are. So, for instance, the displayed formula in which we use single straight lines to represent covalent bonds is just the easiest one to draw. So particularly if you're talking about a complicated molecule, it makes more sense to use that one. One problem with the dot and cross diagram and the displayed diagram and the Lewis diagram is that these molecules look flat. They look like they're 2D and they're really not. Whereas with a ball and stick diagram, it is possible to show the shape of the molecule and show that it is 3D. One advantage of the dot and cross diagram and the Lewis diagram is that we can see the electrons and so it helps us to understand that there are electrons involved in covalent bonds. That's what a covalent bond is. It's a shared pair of electrons. Whereas the ball and stick diagram, it looks like the bonds are physical things that can be touched that are separate from the atoms. And that's not true. So that's a big disadvantage of that model. Finally, for this video, you need to know about giant covalent structures. Whereas a small molecular substance contains just a few atoms bonded together, a giant covalent structure may contain thousands or even millions of atoms, all joined together by strong covalent bonds. Three examples of these are diamond, graphite and silica, which get their own videos later on. All of these are solids with high melting points, because in order to melt these substances, you would need to give the substance enough energy to overcome all of the thousands of strong covalent bonds. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you found that a useful refresher of the basics of covalent bonding. If you did find it useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE chemistry content coming soon.